Okay, good morning, class. Welcome back from the midterm. Um, and uh, I, I think we get back to the normal size of the class. I was pretty surprised that last Friday we have doubled the size, so I didn't I was expecting that. Um, but thank you for coming back to class. Uh, if you're watching the video, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, and I hope you can come back to class. Uh, OK. Um, so uh, the TAs, they're working really hard to grade your midterm. So give them a couple of days. Uh, we'll try our best to get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, if you have any feedback for the midterm, let us know. If it is too hard, too difficult, too easy, too short, too long, any feedback would be welcome. Uh, you know this is a dynamical process. Uh, um, so uh, your feedback will change uh, how the course go. Okay? So um, please, please just let us know. Any one of our teaching staff will be here to listen to your input. Okay, so uh, we are heading to chapter number four uh, on continuous random variables. Uh, this is going to be a both interesting and boring uh, chapter for the following sense. Uh, if you know discrete random variables well, it is a natural extension of the discrete random variables in a very simple way. It is also boring in the following sense that the, the, the concepts are easy, but then the calculations, they're just tedious because you need to do integration and differentiations. Um, and because the calculus is involved, then you, you need to brush up your tool, your, your, your ideas of how do I integrate things using substitution or integration by parts, those uninteresting things. Uh, as we're progressing to chapter five, when we talk about two random variables, then you need to deal with a double integration. Those are just not fun things to deal with. Although I would say that the concepts are pretty interesting. Now, um, what is the biggest challenge of going from a discrete random variable to a continuous random variable? Putting aside the submission to integration, conceptually, what is the most difficult thing to go through uh, is the continuity of uh, the distribution. So to start with, I want to uh, uh, draw a table, okay? Make sure that we are on the same page. The difference between a continuous random variable and a discrete random variable. So on this um, chart, I would say on the left hand side, this is the discrete random variable. And on the right hand side, I have a continuous uh, random variable. Okay, so they're both random variables. Now what is a random variable? Random variable, it is a mathematical object that has multiple states. Each stage, you have a probability of getting that state, right? So for example, if you throw a die, you have six states. You assume it is a fair die, and so you have six faces, so you have one sixth chance of getting each face. Uh, for continuous random variables, you also have a lot of states. But then, how many states do we have? Infinite, okay? So here you have finite number of states, and here you have an infinite number of states. That's a very, very big difference. So here you have a PMF, which is essentially a histogram like this, and then uh, in the continuous case, you have a thing called a PDF. I'm going to explain this term. Uh, you're going to have a function like this. So if here I define it as P of X, right? So this is the PMF. You have multiple states. Uh, here I can also call it P of X, right? It's just a function. It's now a continuous function then I can say that the expected value of uh, this uh, random variable x is going to be the summation of all the state times the, uh, the probability mass, and then I'm going to sum over all the possible states. So that is going to give me the uh, expectation. In the continuous case, 
if you try to calculate the expectation, you also have x times px. But since it is continuous, you're going to replace the submission by integration and then dx. Integrate over all the possible states x inside the sample space omega. So x is in omega, x is in omega. You have dx. Uh, variance will be defined in a similar way. Moments will be defined in a similar way. Uh, so you can say, uh, what is the variance? Uh, the variance would be the summation of x minus mu uh, square px. x is in the set of omega. Uh, then here the variance of x would be the integration of x minus mu square px uh, dx. That should be something we need to expect. Okay. So now the crucial difference is never about this. Uh, summation and integration, that would be easy conceptually, right? It's tedious to do things here, um, but that's not the, the conceptual difficulty. The conceptual difficulty is going from here to here. Can we just simply connect the dots uh, from the histogram to give you a continuous mapping? Can we do that? That, that, that is, a, is, is the key difficulty that we need to ask. So going back to this diagram here, we know that in the discrete case, we are counting the probability of we're counting the frequency of a state to happen, right? Counting. So if you recall in the very beginning of our semester, when I defined the notion of probability, what is probability? It is a measure of the size of a set, right? a set being an event. If we say that an event is a subset inside the sample space, right? It's a, it's a, big set. It's a subset inside a big set. So it's a subset. Now you're measuring the size of the subset. And then when we say measure, you're really defining a ruler. For discrete case, the ruler is a counter. You count or one and two and three, how many times that this event has happened. During a die, flipping a coin, you count the number of heads you have, count the number of tools you have in, in this die. So now if I change the scenario by saying, okay, what is the probability that your bus would come uh, in a certain period of time, right? So whenever we start to talk about this, we're already saying a continuous interval. Your bus will come uh, within the time between one minute and five minutes, okay, so this is the time, uh, what is the probability of that happening? Continuous interval. It's no longer counting one and two and three, okay? You're already measuring the duration of this time interval. So then what is the new ruler? The ruler is measuring the length. It's measuring the length. The tricky thing goes to the following. If you try to measure the length of an event, okay, so let's say you have this uh, axis here, and then you try to say there is a point, there is a point, okay? And then now you say, All right, my, my ruler is no longer a counter. A counter would be easy. Uh, there, is a, there is a count at this location, that's easy. But if I say you have a ruler, you want to measure the length, okay? The length will be the size of a set. You want to measure the length of this point. What is the length of this point? There's a zero. There's a zero, okay? So you say, uh, okay, what is the length of the size? Uh, the length uh, is zero if it is a point. Okay, keep this in mind. So, let's go back to here. If you have all these histograms, if you have all these histograms, they are discrete state. You have one, two, three, four, five. You have discrete state. Each state, you have a, um, a frequency of what is the chance of happening. Now, if you connect the dots, if you connect the dots to make it into a continuous curve, what is the meaning of this dot? 
Here, if I look at this dot, it is a state. I look at the height. This is the probability that x equals to this state. I go to the continuous space. This is still a number one, but of course it is now a continuous uh, a, a, a line that I'm looking at one point on the real line, and this number is one. What is the meaning of this height? What is it? Is it still the probability of x equals to one? I just told you that if, if probability, if probability is the is a measure of the size of a set. Right? You're measuring the size of a set. You try to measure, right? So this is the, the, the size of this set, which is the set that the order state belongs to one. Here I'm looking at one point. I'm asking what is the size of the set? What is that event? That is zero. Okay? And clearly this height here is not zero. But it is definitely not the probability of x equals to 1. What is that thing? OK, what is that thing? So this is, I would say, this, uh, this is not equals to probability that x equals to 1. This is not. Okay? This is just px. It is, it is a number. It is a function evaluated at uh, x equals to 1. Okay? So to be more precise, this is p of 1. It is a value of this function. Okay, what that function is, I haven't defined it yet. But there's a function that is evaluated at a uh, state of 1. So then you are very puzzled. What is that function? What is that function? This function has a functionality. Okay? It has a goal. The goal is to give you the probability. But how does it give you the probability if you say that at 1, it is not 1? It is not, not a probability. Uh, here is the calculus trick. You're going to put a little interval, uh, minus epsilon, plus epsilon, very, very small interval. Here it will be uh, uh, plus epsilon and minus epsilon. Okay? Add a little bit to the left, add a little bit to the right. Okay? And then you try to integrate this area. You try to integrate this area. Now, if your epsilon is zero, then you're looking at a point, then when you integrate that integration, that integral will be zero. Is it clear? Right? But now, if I put a non-zero epsilon to the left, to the right, then I do have a, a, some interval, although it is really small, there is an interval there, then I can do the integration. That integration wouldn't be zero anymore. It will give me some positive value. So what is that value of this integration? Approximately. Engineers, we are not mathematicians. Approximately. It will just be P of 1. This is, this is the height is approximately P of 1. OK, yes. Uh, not there yet, right? So this is, this is uh, approximately P of 1. This is the height. OK, so this is the height. How about the width? Uh, let me make our life easier. Okay, epsilon over two. What is the, what is the width? Epsilon. So the width is epsilon. So the area is area is p of one times epsilon. Okay, p uh, p of one times epsilon. Um, and so how, that should look familiar. That should look familiar to this symbol of called integration. You have your dx, and then you have your fx integrating from 1 minus epsilon over 2 and 1 plus epsilon over 2. Uh, not, not px, uh, not fx, px, OK? px. That should look very familiar. See that? This is your integration of a function from 1 minus epsilon over 2 to plus epsilon over 2. There's a dx here. The dx will take care of the row of this epsilon. You, you do have a width, a little width over there. And what is this thing here? This thing will give you the probability 
of the random variable x that is between 1 plus epsilon over 2 and 1 minus epsilon over 2. And as you set this epsilon to a very, very, very small number, that will approximately give you the probability of x equals to 1. Now, of course, you cannot make epsilon to go to 0. If you make it to 0, then, of course, the probability will go to 0, right? because this is the definition of this, uh, uh, integration. But then uh, your, your probability, now look at this probability. Your probability will be smaller and smaller as you make the epsilon smaller and smaller. Your probability would depend on your epsilon. And therefore, what is this function? This function is, the height of this function is not the probability. This function is called the density function. Probability density function, PDF. Probability density function, uh, PDF. The probability density function, because it is called the density function, it is the density. Okay? You need to provide the, 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 the width okay, to, in order to give you the probability. So what is a density? Density is like a per unit. Okay? Probability per, per unit. Okay? Per, remember this thing called per unit. Whenever you have per unit, you need to multiply the unit. How much, how much width you provide. Okay? So when you, when you look at this topic PDF, you, you never say, what is the probability that x equals to 2.5? You always say that, what is the probability that x is between 2 and 3? It's always between 2 and 3, because you, you need to specify the, the width the unit space, the unit length, you need to provide that. You need to provide that length so that the, the per unit thing can be multiplied up with your, your width to give you the probability. So this is the conceptual difficulty between the discrete random variable and a continuous random variable. Not the calculation. The calculation is just calculus and summation. That's the difference. Okay? But then conceptually, why is it so hard to visualize the probability density function is that Whenever you look at the probability density function, there is this continuity. You're looking at the density. You need to integrate the density function to get the probability. Very abstract. Okay? But that is the overall idea. Okay? At least I want to make sure that you get this really, really rough idea as we are going through the slides. Is it okay? Okay. So let's go to the slides then. So how do we define the probability for continuous events? Well, we can start with the discrete case, where you have pulses here, you have three states. But for the continuous case, as I was mentioning, that you are going to look at a continuous interval. You're going to look at a continuous interval. Within this interval, you want to calculate the area under the curve of this thing called the probability density function, not the mass function. Mass, you have discrete masses. This is a continuous um, a density function. Now, uh, in this uh, set of lecture notes, I'm going to separate between um, Px and Fx. Fx usually denote the continuous case. Px usually denote the discrete case. But as you uh, study further, you can see that people sometimes just always use P, always use F, whatever, whatever text will you use, okay? So people will start to interchange the two. Question? This is a PDF. Yes, yeah, so this is called a PDF. This is called a PMF. Okay, so they have two different names, but as you study more and more uh, later on uh, in other courses, you can see that people just... Uh, uh, use these two notations interchangeably. So that doesn't matter. Okay? Just need to know whether you're integrating a continuous case or you are counting a discrete case. So, that, so that's the pictorial difference. Now, uh, how, do we, how do we understand the probability density function? So uh, let's go through this more formal uh, thinking process. How would you define this event? x is a, a random variable, where this x is inside the set A. How do we measure the size? 
Well, uh, you're going to measure the size of this A and divided by the size of omega, hmm, now definition of probability, right? The relative size of your event to the sample space. So first of all, you measure the entire sample space that you measure your event, A. So if I look at this uh, diagram here, you have a function. Uh, you have a function, you say that this function has a finite support inside this uh, interval of omega. It could be from minus 1 to 1 or from uh, minus 22 to plus 45. So that would be your interval, that would be omega. Within this omega, what is the size of your A? Now, I haven't talked about this function yet, but I will, I will go to that function later on. But I'm just saying that what is the size of A relative to, to omega? We'll just calculate the size of A relative to the size of omega. Okay, so that's the definition. You measure the size of this event A. So let's look at this very simple example. Suppose that you have a sample space uh, with an interval from 0 to 5. That's your omega. And then the event is 2 and 3. Uh, this is the interval from 2 to 3, including 2 and 3. And to measure the size of A, we can just integrate A to determine the length, which is you integrate this length from 2 to 3 divided by you integrate this length from 0 to 5. You get 1, and you get 5, you get 1 over 5. Life is very easy, as easy as you can imagine. Now, more formally, what we can do here is that we can write it in terms of this notation. So the numerator is going to be written as the integration of this dx over the set A. There's nothing copy F X yet. Okay, I'm going to put the F later on. Uh, the denominator will just be the integration of dx over the samples. Uh, the sample space omega. So you have this ratio. The, the denominator will just be the size of your omega. And so you can do the following trick. You can move this 1 over omega into your integration. You may say this is dumb. This is so obvious. Okay? But I'm going to do it. I'm going to, put, I'm going to write this notation. Integration with respect to dx, which is your length, your dummy variable, over the set A for a constant function. Right? This is a constant function. It's, just, it's a scalar. It's a constant function. But I don't mind. It's a constant function. I just say that, well, the, the events, they're equally uh, likely over this uh, set A. That's my interpretation of, the, of this function. It's just equally likely. A smart students like you guys would say, why do we want to restrict ourselves to 1 over omega? Let's just replace it by whatever function I want. Just replace it by my fx, okay, which is my PDF. So the difference is that if you do not have this uh, fx, what you're doing, well, this is your fx, right? this is your fx, and then you're integrating over the side, size, size of A. Okay? And so if you don't put this fx here, uh, you just look at this A, you just look at this omega, then eventually what you're doing is that you just say, ah, okay, this is, this is, my, this is my fx, which is 1 over omega. It's flat. Okay? So I'm looking at this area under the curve, this portion. I, was, I will still have an omega. But then I need to integrate the function using the height specified by my, by my f. So obviously, uh, the natural thing to do is to replace the 1 over omega by this fx. And that is going to give you the probability where x is in this event set a. So this is no different than your PMF, where you have this px, and then you count all, this, uh, all the uh, random variable x inside the event A, and you want to sum them up, and that, that will give you the probability. So there's no difference between this and that. Like one is discrete, one is continuous. But there is a lot more meaning uh, in this continuous case than you would imagine. 
So, uh, here's a diagram again. So let's say uh, I want to calculate the probability uh, that uh, for this discrete case, um, I want to calculate the probability of event A, then you're just looking at px2, so this is probability that x is in A, this is just going to be p of x2 plus p of x3. You just need to count the height of these two, add them up, done. For this one, probability that x is in A, then you need to integrate uh, with respect to dx over the set A using this weighted function is called a PDF in order to get to this probability. So that's the difference between the two. Okay, now let me ask you the following question. Given this setup, can this function fx be going beyond the range of 0 and 1? Now we know that this p is always between 0 and 1. Okay, p is always between 0 and 1 because it's probability mass. Now I'm asking about the PDF. This is a continuous function. Can this continuous function go beyond the range of 0 and 1? Can it? Yes or no? Let's go to the uh, 0 case. Can it go below 0? No. It cannot go below 0. Okay? And the reason is, if you go below zero, you will get negative probability. No matter how you do, okay, you will get negative probability because you're going to integrate. And as soon as you have one point, one point, a delta, okay, is negative, you will have a negative probability. Okay, a delta, a delta is a is a discrete case, right? You can. You can go to delta case, you can say that's a delta function uh, integration with respect to that width, it will give you a mass. So a negative will not allowed, it's not allowed. Okay, you cannot have a negative. Can we have a probability density function with a value that's bigger than one? Is this allowed? Not allowed? Is, can we have a fx that has a value that's bigger than one? Hmm. Puzzling. Anyone will say yes? Yeah. So the the answer is um, uh, because you have a width, you may want to offset the height. Okay. And so the answer is. Yes, fx can be bigger than 1, unlike px. px can never be bigger than 1 because you, your, your width is always 1. Your px, your width is always 1. You're counting. You're counting each mass, so you, you cannot count more than 1. Okay, so no matter how you count, your, your, your total probability cannot be, be more than 1. For the probability density function, I can say what is the probability that my random variable is between 0 and 1, okay, or between 5 and 10. Um, but, but, but you look, I can always also ask what is the probability that my, my random variable is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. In that case, my width, my width will only be 0.1, very, very small width. And in that case, my, my, PM, my, my PDF, the value can be bigger than 1. I, I, and then I'm not violating any of my axioms. The axiom only specify that the probability cannot be bigger than 1. It doesn't matter if my density function is bigger than 1. My density function can be bigger than 1 as long as the width that I'm integrating is small enough that can compensate for all the growth of my PDF. So your fx can be bigger than 1. It cannot be less than 1. It cannot be less than 0, but it can be bigger than 1. So this is a very, very important property that uh, I want to comment on. 
So let's talk about some properties of the PDF. Um, the definition of this probability density function fx of a random variable x is a mapping, okay, just, just like uh, the, uh, 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 the PMF, okay, it is going to assign uh, a state to a number with the following three properties. Number one, uh, it is non-negative for any x inside the sample space. Now, if it is outside the sample space, I don't care. It can be negative. Okay, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, if you integrate uh, this PDF, it got to give you one. Why? Because if you integrate this function, this PDF, it's going to give you the probability. And this integral, this integral here, is the probability of omega. And that has to be one. The third criteria is that you are measuring the size of a set. So if you put x in A, if you measure the probability, this is defined by this integration of fx, and then you integrate with respect to x over the set A. Okay, so that defines the, the measure. So now let's look at... Um, a more concrete definition of how do we calculate the probability. So if you have a continuous random variable, which is an interval, x between a and b, including a and b, then the probability that x is between a and b will be given by this finite integral from a to b of your fx. So that could be very easy calculation. Let me give you an example. And once, once you see the example, you'll understand. You have this. Okay, fx equals to 3x squared, and uh, your omega is between 0 and 1, uh, then your event is between 0 and 0.5. I ask, what is the probability of getting this event A? Now that's easy. You, s you just say probability that x is in A, this is going to be your integration with respect to your x, okay, uh, over the set, it will be 0 to 0 0.5. What is the function? The function is 3x squared, okay? This is calculus, a. is it a or b? I forget. B, right? Is it, is it B? B. Probably calculus B. Okay, who has taken calculus B and got an A? Do it for me. Okay. What, what is the answer? Uh, oh, okay. I shouldn't show it to you. <laughs> One eighth? Uh, let's just do it. Uh, how do I do it? Okay, I, I need to recall. Oh, holy crap, how do we do this integration? <laughs> um, oh, it's cube. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now we got it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, smile. Okay. Okay. Good. So this is calculus. Okay. So, so let me tell you the experience. When I was a student, I really hate that problem because it's all testing my calculus fluency. Not really testing about whether I understand the problem or not. Unfortunately, there's no shortcut and there's no way. I, I try all my best for the past couple of years to design a problem that doesn't test you that much on the tedious calculus. I'm still learning how to do it. I uh, promise I'm working really hard on my side to avoid this kind of calculation, but sometimes it's unavoided. Okay, so just practice a little bit on things like that. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's do another problem. Um, this is a little bit easier. So your, your fx is 1 over omega. So this is a constant. Uh, so then what is your, um, then what is your um, uh, probability? So your probability, probability that x is in A, is going to be the integration. Again, your dx, right? Then your function is 1 over omega. 
you're, you're integrating from 3 to 5. Now, what is your omega? Your omega is between 0 and 5, and therefore the size of this omega is 5. So integrating from 3 to 5 of 1 over 5, dx. Okay, so then that should be easier because you can pull out the 1 over 5, you're integrating 3 to 5 dx, so that will give you 2, so you get uh, 2 over 5. So smile again. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So the very easy calculation, you can see that, um, not, not the tedious part, but, but the conceptually is you really, you put down the probability density function, you integrate with, with respect to the range that you are being asked, right? Then you can calculate the probability. Again, this number, this 3x squared evaluated at 0.5, that is not a probability at 0.5. That's just the density function at 0.5. You need to integrate this 3x squared give you the range to tell you the probability. So that is cleared. Now, can fx be bigger than, um, be, than, than 1? Uh, the answer is yes. Okay, very clear. This is yes. Uh, fx is not the probability of having the random variable uh, at the state small x. It is not. Uh, fx is the per probability per unit length, per unit area, per unit space, per unit time, per unit. And therefore, you need to have this unit thing going inside. So for example, if you look at this random variable x between x and x plus delta, then you are going to get this fx evaluated at small x times the width of delta, as what we just discussed. Right? So you have this width times this height. That will give you the probability. Question? OK, got a question. Do you guys hear a question? So what if my f is bigger than 1, and my, my, and my delta is bigger than, also bigger than 1? Will I screw it up? Yes, you will screw it up. And that's not allowed. OK? That's not allowed by the axiom number 2. You are not allowed to create a probability density function with a value bigger than 1, and your sample space is bigger than 1. Right? You need to specify the sample space. If your sample space has a length of bigger than 1, okay, and then your density function is going up bigger, bigger than 1, if you have, if you have that, okay, then that means you need to integrate. If you integrate the thing, from minus infinity to infinity of your fx, that has to be always equal to 1. But if we follow your suggested uh, probability density function, that will be violated. Okay? That axiom will be violated because you want to make sure that your integration of your fx dx from minus infinity to infinity is 1. That has to be always fulfilled. This thing can be bigger than 1, but then this overall integral cannot be bigger than 1. So you cannot choose a delta that is big, and then your average is bigger than 1. That is not allowed. That will not happen unless you make a mistake in your exam. Question. Um, can it be smaller than 1? Can the total be smaller than 1? This integral from minus infinity to infinity cannot be smaller than 1. It got to be 1. It must be one. Okay? Now, if you're measuring a subset inside this interval, you're fine. Okay? This minus infinity to plus infinity, that is the equivalent to your omega. So if I don't like this uh, minus infinity, sometimes I may not define the probability with, um, from minus infinity to infinity. I may have a finite set. Then the integral over the entire sample space of your fx dx got to be one. So it cannot be smaller than 1. Again, this is axiom number 2. So I want to give you an example. Here is a probability density function with this ugly formula. 1 over 2 uh, square root of x. 
uh, it is defined for the range of zero, uh, not including zero. Zero is, is not included because if, if zero is included, then your fx will go to infinity. Okay, so zero is not included, uh, but you can approach to infinity. Uh, one is included. All right, so uh, then zero otherwise. We can show that this thing, okay, you can show this. Um, <clears throat> You can show two things. Number one, that's one over two square root of x. How does it look like, by the way? It is an increasing function, decreasing function. Going up or going down. Decreasing. Okay, it's a decreasing function. Is monotonically decreasing or is a staircase kind of decreasing or will it go flat? How does it look like? You go down, you always go down, right? It's a monotonically decreasing function. Not very fast uh, at, the, at the rate of uh, square root, one over square root. So it looks like this, okay? It will converge to a number uh, which is zero, okay? But uh, I will clip this function at one, so it will stop at here. It wouldn't be smaller than uh, one, okay? Now at one, the height will be uh, one over two. This is the height, so I wouldn't go smaller than that. Uh, how about the, um, uh, as, as my x goes to zero, the other end? What will be the value? Uh, as x goes to zero, will it go to one? No, it doesn't go to one. You go up, 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 okay? All the way up. Oh, maybe I misinterpret your finger, okay? It's always going up. I thought it was one. Okay, it's always going up. And then, um, does f at, z uh, no, that's not the right notation. Limit of this fx, x goes to zero is infinity. <laughs> that's the right notation. Okay, so it's all the way going up. Okay, so that means this number can be bigger than one. Way bigger than one. Now, is it a problem? Not a problem at all, because I can integrate this function, I can integrate this function from uh, minus infinity. Well, basically it will be from zero to one, that is my sample space. From zero to one, right? And then I can integrate this thing in, uh, Okay, I sort of forget how I can get from here to here. But anyway, I think this is right. Um, so you can have this formula here, then you can have integral from zero to one. Okay, so this is, uh, I, need to, I need to buy the textbook on calculus. Um, okay, so you get this uh, integral from zero to one, then you get one. Okay, so ignoring the calculation inside, but just looking at this formula, the, the leftmost is your integration over the entire sample space for a probability density function that has a value bigger than one. Your, your, your fx can be bigger than one. And after you do all these calculations, you just get one. And why is this the case? Well, yes, you are shooting beyond one, right? You're shooting beyond one, but that's okay the, the area that you should beyond this, no, let's say one is here, right? Let's say one is here. The area that you should beyond this one is actually small, okay? It's smaller than one. Yes, you ha your height is, is tall, but then your width is so small that it doesn't matter. Your overall probability is still one if you integrate the entire sample space. Okay, so that's a counter example to show you why fx can be bigger than one. So uh, very soon, you're gonna learn uh, normal random variable, Gaussian random variable, you're, you're gonna look at uh, high dimensional distributions. Uh, you will see many, many cases on computer, your Python, your MATLAB, that this, this number is bigger than one, and then you, you, you freak out. Ah, how can my probability be bigger than one? And I'm telling you right now that you're dealing with probability density functions. So you will see numbers bigger than one, that is, very normal, okay, until you integrate things. 
Now, when you look at this example, uh, this is also interesting by looking at this range. From 0 to 1, not including 0, that is going to be the same as you include the 0. Because the point 0 has a measure 0. It doesn't carry any mass. All right? So if you have a closed interval versus you have an open interval or a left open, right close, or left close, right open, they are all the same. They're all the same. Okay? A single point doesn't matter. So if I make a mistake by, by asking, hey, what is the probability that x is between uh, 0 and 1, or if I write it as uh, 0x1, uh, if x is continuous over the entire sample space, they're the same. They will become different if x is a little bit hybrid. A hybrid means that on one side it is continuous, on the other side you have a discrete event, then they may be different. For discrete events, that, uh, the closed and open intervals, they, are, they mean different things. Right? So we'll come back to the example later on. So finally, I just want to say a few words about the connection with the PMF. Uh, the PDF is this Fx. If I have a PMF, which is this Px, I can write, I can write the PMF as the PDF notation using the delta functions. Something that you probably have learned in 301. So this is the probability mass, and here is a delta function with an offset in terms of the location to a point of xk. Okay? So here you have a delta function. Uh, if I have this delta of x minus k, then I have a delta here located at xk. So if I also multiply this delta with p of xk, then I will have a height here. If I have a summation over uh, all the xk's, then I will have uh, another p of xk minus 1. This is an x of k minus 1. So these will just be a, uh, my continuous representation of a discrete random variable. You can do that. Uh, does it matter? It doesn't really matter as far as our course is concerned. But later on, uh, if you try to take advanced courses, you want to deal with uh, a mixture of random variables, then it will become a, a thing to remember. For example, a Bernoulli random variable, uh, you can write it in terms of the PDF using the delta function notation, where P will be associated with delta of x minus 1. So this is centered at 1. 1 minus P will be associated with uh, 0. So you have delta of x minus 0. So that would be the continuous expression of the uh, discrete random variable, a uh, Bernoulli random variable. Here is another notation for the binomial random variable. So you have the delta of x minus k, binomial uh, 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 PMF values, summation. Okay. So these are just notation. Uh, uh, in terms of calculation, this is also pretty straightforward. Uh, you're not doing anything different. Okay. As I mentioned, you're not doing anything different. It's just uh, the notation is slightly uh, more involved, that now you need to take care of all these delta functions. Let's say you have a discrete PMF of 1 over 2 to the power k. How do you evaluate this random variable between 1 and 2? You don't really write down the delta function, just count 1 and 2. Some them. But in terms of the delta function, it is the same thing. Okay, it's, again, it's a little bit tedious. I, I'm not requiring you to do things in that way. I'm just bringing up, right? So the last couple of slides, I'm not going to test you. I just want to tell you that if you want to connect uh, the discrete and the continuous case, this is the way. So if you have a random variable x is between 0 and uh, or 1 and 2, and then I tell you this is the continuous expression integrated in that delta functions, literally you just integrated the delta functions at these points. And then the delta functions uh, at these points will give you uh, 1. Okay, you, you remember if you integrate any delta function, this delta x uh, dx um, from minus infinity to infinity, this is going to give you 1. Okay, so that's the delta definition of the delta function. So you integrate every 1, you get 1, and then 
uh, now you, when you look at this, x is at 3, but then you're integrating from 1 and 2, that will give you a 0. So you don't count that point. Right? These two, 1 and 2, you include the 2. You count that point. Uh, this one, you, you count that point. That one, you don't count the point. Right? So you count, count, don't count. So 1 half, 1 quarter, you get 3 quarters. Question? Yes, fx is a continuous function. It's given by this formula here. This is your fx. Yeah, what is the value between 1 and 2? Those are zeros. So the value, so it is a, it, the, the, the fx function, you have a delta at 1, you have a delta at 2, in between it is 0. It is 0 everywhere except at 1, except at 2. In this function, you have a pulse x minus 1, a delta x minus 2. So this is a very bizarre function, but it is a function. It is 0 everywhere. Okay? So as you integrate any, any way between, you get a 0. Okay? So that is the connection between the discrete and the continuous. If you want to write everything in a continuous way, here is the way to go. Okay, So I will stop at this point. And then uh, when we come back on Wednesday, I will talk about more properties of this co uh, continuous random variable.